Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak and I am standing next to my second generation prototypes of my new double paddle canoe design here. I just got some new glasses and some new studio lighting so I can see you better, you can see me better. So let's go ahead and talk about what's going on with these boats. So kind of just going back to the very beginning of this design, I like to recap things because some people jump into this a little later in the process. What I'm doing with this whole double paddle canoe design is I'm trying to create a boat that is the absolute simplest, fastest, most inexpensive, most lightweight, easiest to use small watercraft that you can possibly have. Now, I mean, of course there's things that are, are even easier, but they don't meet all of those criteria. And I really think a well-built double paddle canoe kind of epitomizes this entire concept. And so for the last few months, I've been working on this design here. I've got some really unique things about this particular boat. The biggest one of them being the fact that unlike all of the other canoes that you see out there, this boat is built completely without thwarts. And that means that you can take the stuff out of it and you can nest them one into the other. And if you look at this here, this isn't one canoe. These are actually two canoes that are nested perfectly into each other here. And so that is a huge part of this design. It's really cool because it saves a lot of space in your basement or your backyard or on top of your car. And it's just kind of neat. I mean, you could envision really weird circumstances where you have to actually go and paddle and meet a friend. You could actually put two of these on the water, get into the middle one, paddle them, take the middle one out of the bigger one, and then both of you guys could paddle away. So it's kind of a novelty in some ways, but it seems to be in real life really functional and really handy. And it doesn't seem to be have some of the problems that I was concerned about initially with it being way too flexy or it's slowly opening up over time or slowly closing up over time. Although there is a devil of a lot of complexity that goes into not the building process once I figured this out, but just the actual process of figuring it out in the first place. So pretty proud of that. But just having canoes that nest together and are made out of skin on frame and are really lightweight does not make a good canoe. A good canoe is a canoe that actually paddles well on the water. And this is something I've really had to kind of bootstrap my way into because I'm not a double paddle canoeist. My entire life history is as a rowboater and a sailboater and a kayaker. I was annoyed to death by canoes and Boy Scouts and so I never went that way as an adult. But the idea of a small double paddle canoe, even though it's not quite as sleek and not as fast as a kayak, really appeals to me because it is a lot more versatile than a kayak in a lot of ways. Yeah, you can't punch out through a 10 foot surf and get pounded and roll up, but let's face it, most people aren't doing that kind of boating in the first place. And you can bring a child or a dog, you can easily throw a bunch of gear in one of these things, you can lay down and look at the sky. There's just so much versatility in an open boat, especially if it's a boat that has a thwart that can be removed, so you can use the entire interior of the boat in any way that you want. So kind of a cool design here, but I do have to figure out how to make the hull shape right. So I've just been kind of going by eye trying to figure this out really, you know, trying building different boats, testing different boats. Uh, originally, you know, I started looking at different pack canoes that were available out there and the first thing that struck me is that I didn't really trust that they have enough shear. And I'm not saying that anybody's boats are bad, I think it just reflects the conditions that those particular boats are designed to be used in. And by having a lower shear, which is the curve at the top of the gunnels, your boat is definitely a lot less vulnerable to the wind, which is gonna make it faster in any kind of a wind situation. But a lower shear also, and also having a higher shear, of course, increases the amount of stuff the boat has to be built with, which increases the weight as well. So I feel like the balance in a pack canoe is just like an Adirondack guide boat, just like so many of these other exquisite small boats that were built in the Adirondacks around that historical time period, around the 19, 18, late 1800s, 1900s, they, because they were building them with just traditional wooden boat techniques, they really had to be as parsimonious as possible with the design and also with the materials. Otherwise, these things would have been way too heavy to portage between the lakes. And that's kind of cool because, you know, it really speaks to a lot of what modern people want. Back then, it was more about necessity. For modern people, it's more about convenience. We really want to have the lightest, easiest to use things. And so by taking that general idea and applying it to skin on frame, you know, it just seems to be a really good marriage there, the whole like small pack canoe skin on frame thing because you can build really lightweight boats and skin on frame. And I feel like a lot of these designs were pretty good in their original form. I think that, you know, the flavor that people have gone with with modern pack canoes is a little bit different. And at least for my own personal use, I tend to like a little bit more of the traditional shapes that have a little bit more sheer because you know it's it's a little safer if you're heading into a chop or you're out on a big windy lake 
And it's just about really finding the perfect balance there because you don't want to go too far in one direction or another. So that's a really long-winded way of saying that I decided to put a little more shear in my canoes than you see with most of the pack canoes that are out there. And that was just a wild guess. My first two prototypes, I put one shear in and then I ribbed them. I got my rib system kind of semi-figured out. I decided I didn't really like it. And so I tossed those aside and then I laminated up a shear for my second set of prototypes. And then I actually built those into finished canoes and I took them out on the water. Water. But that particular set of prototypes has some issues because one of the things that I wasn't expecting when you're building a boat with a laminated shear and perfectly plumb gunnels is that even if you constrain the gunnels to vertical in the middle and on the ends, there's going to be a tremendous amount of flex in the intermediate points and that's going to flare the gunnels slightly like this and the overall net effect that that's going to have is it's going to pull some of that shear out. So I had an original intended shear and then I built the boats and they actually ended up having about an inch less shear. And then I went ahead and set the rocker the way that I thought it should be. I set the hull shape the way that I thought it should be. And I got everything out there and I tried it out and you know the hull felt like it was a little bit too full, a little too sluggish. This may actually just be my imagination because I'm so used to paddling really, really swift kayaks, really easy to slip through the water boats. So it could be that's just the nature of this particular type of boat. But I felt like I could get a little bit more out of the hull shape. So in moving from that set of prototypes to this set of prototypes, I had a couple goals. I wanted to introduce a little bit more shear to compensate for the shear that flexed out of it before and I wanted to reduce the rocker a little bit because they seemed like they were just a little bit too maneuverable and also I wanted to reinforce the frame a little bit more because I felt like even though it was working and there wasn't really much damage being done I just felt like the bottom stringers here made out of red cedar were just a little bit too fragile and uh, I like to use things just horrifically. I don't think this will be a problem for anyone else, but I pretty much treat my boats like they're made out of rotomolded plastic. And so that's the way I figure out if there's going to be any failures that people are going to encounter because it's really important for me to test the crap out of these things so nobody that buys my plans or buys a boat from me has any surprises on the water. So. And this particular boat design here, this particular generation of canoes, uh, what I did was I built a couple of intermediate sized canoes. I had a very small one before, a middle one, and a big one, and they all nested into each other. And in this set of prototypes, what I did was I got, I made an intermediate size between those three, and that would give me five kind of different sizes that I could kind of compare because one of the things I'm doing here is just trying to get the displacement dialed in for different weights and different size users because the cool thing about skin on frame is you really can dial the displacement in a lot closer than you could with other types of boat building because you don't have all the jigs and molts and things like that you can build very closely to the individual paddler weight and I so <laughs> catch my breath get my train of thought here um, so what I did was I went out and I laminated up some gunnels and I laminated an inch more shear into this particular set of gunnels. I got rid of the wedges that I added last time because I just figured it was a pain. It does look a little bit nicer than this particular type of a way to make a shear, you know, to have the actual the, the lamination plus the little wedge that's shaped at the end. But the complexity really isn't worth what it costs. And so I just figured I would ditch that and laminate the actual shear curve a little bit deeper. And then I set up my rocker, set up my stems, and I started ribbing it and just really playing with my rib bending system because the big thing that I do here, the hardest thing that I do, is creating stable mathematical systems that you can use to make your hull shape for your boat that aren't reliant on molds and forms and aren't reliant on specific measurements either. And that is not always possible in boats. I tried for years to make it work with my West Greenland kayak, but there was no set of mathematical relationships that I could apply to that that would ever make that work. So to scale that particular kayak, you actually have to proportionally scale it and proportionally scale all the measurements. And it's a huge pain in the ass and you have to be very careful because if you make a mistake and things get off, that's a problem. And with all the rest of my boats, everything works off a proportional system. So there's a mathematical relationship between various proportionalities of the boat 
and various rib lengths that can be exploited to basically just walk down the gunnels really quickly, take a piece of rib across the gunnels, figure out the actual adjustment factors, and then cut those at the, that length, and then you just put them in the steam box, you bend them in by eye, you have a little bit of a keel to check the height, and then boom, when you're done, you've actually got your hull shape. And it is reproducible, and it also works across a wide range of widths and lengths. And I mean, of course, you know, it's gonna break down at extreme proportions, but my goal at this stage in the process is to play with that system as much as I can and see how truly stable it is across different boat dimensionalities. And more importantly, is it actually making the hull shape I want? And this is an issue that I'm facing right now because the way that this system is working for me, I'm still ending up with too much fullness in the ends of the canoe. And the net effect that that has is it can potentially make the canoe sluggish if you're entering the water a little too quickly and it can also bring the boat up a little bit, which is good. I mean, it's good to be higher in the water in a lower volume boat that doesn't have a deck on it, but it has the unintended consequence of sitting the entire boat on a narrower water line, which is also good because it makes the boat faster, but, and it carries its speed a little bit better even though it isn't as quick upon acceleration, but it can reduce the stability because you're not sitting down onto your lines and so you don't have the same physical sensation of a riding moment. So everything is always trade-offs. You can't really screw up a boat. All you can do is make it do something really well and something else really bad. And so what I've been trying to do is work this mathematical system I'm developing so it will suck a little bit more volume out of the ends. And I haven't gotten it yet. I got a little closer on this one, but I also got a lot closer to understanding various things about it, you know, by building these boats. But I didn't get quite where I was aiming for. And what I was doing here, you might ask, well, why did you skin the boat if the shape wasn't what you wanted? It's because whenever you're building something, you have to move forward slowly between iterations because if you move too quickly and you cross a threshold into a better or worse part of the design, and you moved quickly with big changes, you don't know where that threshold was, which means that you can't identify it, which means you can't reproduce it and explain it to other people in the future. So super important to work slowly. And the biggest problem with these two prototypes here is that I thought I was working slowly and I wasn't working slowly enough. It's actually, a little bit frustrating because I spent like a week and a half and a whole bunch of money building these particular boats and I really, they look beautiful and I wanted to get into them and I wanted to love these boats, but actually getting on the water in them, you know, I realized that I didn't work slowly enough and I overshot some important thresholds and so I ended up kind of basically not getting what I wanted out of it and I'm going to have to back up to a boat that is nearly identical to the ones I was building before and then see how that works and then I could start moving forward again and it's, you know it's really frustrating because I don't have a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time to finish this design I've got until September to get it at least 60 percent complete so I can release a beta test before I completely run out of money and I have to go do something else so you know lots of work to do not a lot of wood and time and money to do it in but I just kind of want to talk about kind of what went wrong here and what I don't like about this because I feel like it's kind of informative, you know, to understand these processes. So basically, in trying to, con you, you heard me say, you know, a whole bunch of sentences back here that I wasn't controlling the flex in the gunnels as it was wrapping from the center mold to the end molds and I was getting flare in the intermediate points that was sucking out the shear. Well, the net effect that that had is it was pressing down the volume of the boat in that area and it was making my rib system a little bit too full. And it was also changing my rocker a little bit in weird ways. You know, it was good initially, but then it actually started to change as that flex changed as I actually ribbed the boat and the gunnels were sucked in a little bit more, which brought the shear more closer to its original shear point, which increased the rocker, which made the boats too maneuverable. So lots and lots of issues from that one small issue, which was not controlling the flex. 
And I saw it initially when I was doing it and I chose not to control that flex because I needed to see if it was actually gonna be a problem because one of my absolute core values in building these kind of boats is not to add additional complexity to these boats that you guys don't actually need. There's so much in skin boat building where people do so many superfluous things that are totally unnecessary because a book told them that was the right thing to do. And I think if you could really distill the Cape Falcon boat building process, honestly, the reason my boats are a lot faster and easier to build than other people is I leave out a bunch of these steps that are totally superfluous. And I needed to make sure that I didn't need to control for that actual flex at this intermediate point here before I actually controlled it. So, you know, it's not surprising that it didn't work out, but it could have worked out. And what I should have done with this latest iteration is kept everything exactly identical. I should have kept the shear identical. I should have, should have kept the stem height identical. I should have kept my rocker settings perfectly identical. And if I would have done the one thing, one simple thing and controlled that flex in this area like I did in this generation of canoes with another spreader that was screwed in in that location, then it would have probably, I can't say for sure, you guys will know next generation because this is exactly what I'm gonna do. It would have probably actually given me the boat that I wanted right here. But by overshooting that, because I wasn't willing to move slowly enough, I ended up with a boat with a little too much shear. It doesn't, doesn't have enough rocker. You know, it just projected a problem. All the compensations that I was trying to do in addition to that one little thing I needed to change were probably unnecessary. So now I gotta back up and do it all over again. But you know, there are some good things that I learned about this because there's stuff not relating to that particular shaping factor that is really, really important. And I decided to put in some yellow cedar stringers. These could just as easily be fir or pine or anything else on the bottom here as opposed to the red cedar stringers because I wanted it to be a little stronger in this area down here for really rough use. And that works out really well. You know, it definitely makes the boat stronger in this area and it doesn't increase the weight very much. The bigger canoe here is 19 pounds and the smaller canoe is 17 pounds. So it only gave me about a pound more weight for a significant increase in durability. And I think that's a really good trade off there. Um, but there was an unintended consequence of that. And that is that these particular stringers are a lot stiffer than red cedar and they introduced tension into the hull, which pulled some of my rocker out. And where I was aiming for a three quarter inch rocker, I ended up with a flat rocker. And that's not to say that a flat rockered boat is bad necessarily. It's just not what I was looking for in this particular case. So that is an important thing to learn because if I'm releasing these plans, I need to be able to tell you guys how to compensate for different types of wood species and their flex characteristics so you can get the rocker that we're actually aiming for here. But like I said, not everything that changes something is necessarily completely a mistake. And when I got this on the water, what I was hoping would happen is that I would be able to turn the boat 90 degrees with a single stroke because that is the perfect amount of maneuverability for a small boat. Because if you can turn the boat more than that with a single stroke, you're losing way too much energy to wagging back and forth. But if you go less than that, you know, you, yes, the boat is transmitting more of your forward energy to forward motion, but it drives you crazy because you've got to take a million strokes just to turn the boat a little bit. And if you've ever paddled an actual original Wee Lassie, a lot of them are, they're kind of stiff in the water. They're not as maneuverable as I would like. So I'm actually departing from what a lot of people do with my maneuverability here. And if this had actually held the rocker that I had intended it for, I think the maneuverability would have been right in the zone. But because I didn't know about the effect these stringers were gonna have on the rocker, I, I couldn't make that determination. And so they ended up a little bit stiffer, but this had some really positive effects because the other big plan besides just making this a good little paddling canoe is to make it a really fun little sailing canoe. Nothing too high performance, but just something that has a really nice bow stepped sail that you can pop up really quickly and then cruise across the wind. And the problem I was having with the last ones is because they were so loose on the water, they were both sitting high and the ends weren't engaged, there wasn't a lot of lateral resistance. So I, was, I could see potential for this sail to drive really nicely, you know, relatively for what this boat is exactly, but it, it wasn't realized and it was just, ah, it was frustrating me. So um, in this particular generation of boats, these boats having a better bite in the water has definitely improved that. You know, the boat seems to scoot across the wind, you know, not amazingly well, but pretty reasonably well. And I think with an increase in the efficiency of that particular sail shape, which 
will happen eventually over time. I imagine there'll be a lot more experimentation with that. The combination of a little less volume here, a little more bite, and a slightly more efficient sale. And now we're starting to get into the zone where I can turn, I can get in this thing, pop up the sail, and not be frustrated and be like, yeah, this is a fun little sailing experience, which is what I'm headed for. And also, with these boats having a little more bite on the water, all of a sudden the leeboard system that I wasn't all that stoked on in the last video seemed to work a lot better. I mean, I still don't know if ultimately it's worth the extra complexity, but I can say that if you're interested in it with this particular amount of bite in the water stabilizing the canoe so it doesn't pivot around a central point, then that leeboard actually starts to really come into its own and really starts to drive the canoe. And I got much better upwind performance in these. I was actually able to climb to windward, not well, but slightly. The other ones were pretty much a wash on a dead beam reach. So definitely an improvement in that area. The boats are a little stiffer than I want right now. They're not as maneuverable as I want, you know, and they feel a little bit weird to me, but a lot of that might just be my lack of experience with double paddle canoes. But you know, I can tell that the direction I was trying to move in is gonna be profitable. I just need to actually back off on the rocker a little bit again and compensate for the problem with these stiff stringers in the bottom here. And I still need to do more work to decrease the, hull, the volume of the hull shape here. Um, that mathematical system that I just mentioned for the rib lengths is, it's, I can't wait to release it. I can't talk about it here because it's kind of a proprietary thing, but it's actually really friggin' elegant. I mean, it's, it's, it's got a mathematical symmetry to the, to the formula that really surprises me. It almost feels like there's kind of a cosmic influence there because of the way the numbers come out. And uh, I, it's not quite giving me what I want right now, but I have wiggle room inside of it before the system breaks down. So I feel confident that on the next version of these, I'm, I'm gonna be closer and I'm kind of frustrated because this version should have been there and if I just would have controlled that one simple variable of the, of the flex, it probably would have been there, but now I have to back up and start over. Um, but you know, there's always things to learn and it's, it's necessary, it sucks, but it's necessary to build bunches of things to really understand what you're doing. And I learned some really things that seem minor but are extremely important in this, you know? I mean, I've built, I don't know, 20 sets of laminated gunnels over my entire kayaking career and I've never had a problem. But this last set of laminated gunnels that I did for these particular canoes, it, I was clamping them uh, all in one side of the curve first and then up the other side of the curve. And that had the unintended consequence on this one set of gunnels of actually changing the curve from side to side. And when you're building a symmetrical canoe and using the same forms and measurements and rib lengths for everything, well, that's a real problem because suddenly you've projected a problem into the shape on one end versus the other. So hugely important thing to learn, seems pretty minor when you're clamping a set of laminated gunnels, always clamp from the center outwards. So that was important. And then other stuff that seems absolutely trivial, but could really result in a serious problem for someone on the water is just stuff like these little pad eyes up here. I don't know if this is in the field of view of the camera, but at the front of each of these boats, I've got these little pad eyes right here that end up being a place where you can tie a grab handle, but they are also the loop that the halyard for the mast goes through. And the first sets of these that I did, it worked great. You know, it was totally free flowing through here and I pulled it back to the jam cleat. Everything's good. It comes up really easy. It comes down really easy. And if you want anything with a sail to be safe, you'd better be sure that you can get the rig down when you need to get it down rapidly. And that was fine for these little crappy zinc plated guys that I got from the hardware store or nickel plated, I should say. But you know, I wanted a little bit of a higher quality pad eye. And so I ordered some other stainless steel pad eyes off the internet from Duckworks. And you know, they're great little pad eyes, really strong. They're the ones made by Sea Dog. And I put them on here and I got out there with my sail and I pull my sail up and it's a little hard to get up. And then I go to take my sail down and I can't get it down because there is a significant difference between the construction of, I mean, it's barely anything. It's micro, you wouldn't even notice it, but this pad eye versus the big stainless steel pad eye, this one has a really abrupt transition from flat to the curve. And the other one kind of comes up like this. And what that does is it allows the halyard to jam right into that corner. And you know, that creates an unsafe situation. So really important that I found out that this is the right pad eye and those other ones aren't. And I think these are fine nickel plated, honestly. I don't think you need stainless steel for this particular application. So that was a really important bit of learning as well. So 
Um, I think final thing that I learned on this particular generation is that uh, the rudder system that I've been trying to make work for this, both to mount a rudder and to mount a kayak motor, is not working. And what I wanted there was to have something that would be just a simple cross member with some holes in it that can be bungeed anywhere in the kayak. And this works fantastic as a backrest. It works great as a mount for a lee board. But when I move it to the very back rib and I mount a uh, rudder tiller situation onto it that way, I just don't have the steerage I need. I was hoping that with a good foil shaped rudder of appropriate size or maybe even a little oversized, I would, ha I would be able to use that with a straight tiller to go downwind. And, uh, it, because, and the reason I do that is because I just, it, just my own personal preference, I hate push-pull tillers, which is what you would have on most canoes and on a stern mounted uh, a canoe rudder or you would have a rope type system which gets you get a lot of side to side motion on the rudder without having the sweep of a tiller and I just had this fantasy that I was going to be able to create a good enough foil shaped rudder and that thing was going to be far enough back and my tiller arrangement would be fine enough that with just the little bit of play that I have right here I could steer the canoe effectively without having to go to a push pull tiller situation. Great idea if it works and it doesn't. So um, <laughs> that idea is toast, but that idea being gone means that I have to come up with another solution for that. Now, I don't know if this is really necessary for most people that are gonna build this because I feel like honestly, most people are just gonna go with the really simple version where you sail this thing by shifting your weight because it works so darn well, then why have the extra complexity? But for me, I want to at least theoretically have a really good clean system for mounting a kayak a rudder or a kayak motor for people who do feel like going down the rabbit hole of lee boards and a slightly bigger sail, things like that. And so um, that system is gone and I'm gonna to have to start at the stern and see if I can design a small, easy to install, easy to take out, really compact push-pull rudder um, that doesn't drive me crazy. So that should be interesting as well. Um, and also, <laughs> that system was only, I, the reason I was so attached to that is because it works so well as a lee board system, but if it's not gonna be useful at the stern of the boat, then it's kind of a stupid way to do a lee board right in this area, there's better ways to do it. And so I think ultimately everything I showed with the whole reversible tiller situation in the sail video is probably gonna go bye-bye and we'll have some kind of a separate rudder situation and then some type of a lee board bracket, although that will still probably mount on top of the gunnels with bungees because, you know, it's really nice to be able to just unmount that whole thing and set it out of the way because, you know, lee board setups are cumbersome and they really interfere with using something as a nice paddling canoe. And generally when you see sailing canoes, you don't see a sailing canoe that somebody likes to paddle and also likes to sail. They're usually dedicated. And I'm trying to make something that does well in both. And that's always a dangerous idea because a lot of times when you try to make things that do multiple things well, you just end up with something that does multiple things badly. And so you really have to be honest with yourself about how things are going and also constrain your parameters so you don't try to push things too far. So uh, lots, lots to say there. Uh, next steps for me is that I'm going to back up on this design. and. Um, I'm going to rebuild these exact boats exactly like this. The only difference is I'm going to take a little bit of the shear out back to, and I'm going to go back to my original rib measurement system. I'm going to control for that flex, go back to my original rockers and see if that actually gets me into the sweet spot. And if it does, that will be kind of embarrassing, but I did learn a lot from this particular iteration. Um, as far as the overall feeling of sluggishness of these canoes, I don't want to misrepresent this because I'm kind of like the Steve Jobs of skin on frame kayaks. I hate everything. Like I am the most, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nice guy in, in person and in real life, but when it comes to boat design, I am just an intolerant tyrant and I can't stand things that are even slightly annoying, you know? And so everybody that's tried these canoes really likes them, but when I get in them, I'm really frustrated. So I might not be the best person to listen to about what's good and what's bad, um, but I just feel like, I, I feel like there's a, there might be an issue with the hull shape in the front here. Whenever you're building on a hard shined hull, especially at the bow entry, you have to be uber careful to make sure that any hard shine transitions are kept to just a couple degrees or less. Because if the water transitions over a hard shine, 
too abruptly, it's gonna create a nasty vortex. And F1s that are built with a slightly too big bow rib end up just paddling like crap for that reason. And it's so interesting with small boat design because there are so many things that people fixate on that they think means makes a big difference that just means absolutely nothing because the boundary layer of turbulent water is so thick on a boat and gets thicker the faster you go. But you know, there's also things about hull shaping that really do make a difference and it's just kind of, you know, with small boats, trial and error is just as important as any kind of ship modeling software because the viscosity of the water at that scale combined with the small wave effects of chop and also the asymmetrical thrust of a paddler paddling with a paddle really throws so many variables into it that, you know, if you try to just do everything with math, you know, there's a lot of kayaks out there that were designed perfectly with math and are terrible. And so, you know, I'm just a lot more prone to just doing things by eye and doing a lot of testing. And I think maybe sometimes that comes out with a better small boat, although you do end up burning a lot of prototypes in the process. All right, so that is what I have to say about my new iteration, generation here of double paddle canoes. Um, they're not exactly what I wanted, but they do give me a learning platform over the next couple weeks to uh, get out on the water and learn about some other things that are equally important to this design. Rescue strategies, flotation strategies, canoe covers, things like that. Unfortunately, I've got to jump on another project for a month. I've got to do a lot of updates to my kayak building videos, so I'm not going to be able to really put much time into this, but I am so looking forward to getting that done. If you're taking my video courses, by the way, keep an eye out in a few weeks because there's going to be a lot of videos that are updated and improved there. And then after all that is off my plate, I'm going to dive right back into this. I'm hoping to get two more of these done in August. And if I'm lucky, I want to get two more completely different ones done in August that really stretch the dimensionality of this to a whole different level, you know, really wide and short and also really long and skinny because I need to see if that rib system could actually be stable to, you know, broader, you know, changes in depth to width and length ratio and stuff like that. So lots to do, lots to learn. I'm going to try to paddle these and not hate them, you know, over the next couple of weeks and definitely loan them out to friends who aren't nearly as picky or, or ridiculous as I am about it. I'm kind of uh, scared to edit this video because I'm probably going to leave all of this in here and I'm sure that I just talked for a really long time, but thanks for following along. Hopefully you got some good information out of this. I will uh, see you in my other videos that I'm making over the next couple of weeks and I'll see you probably uh, in a few weeks with some updates on these canoes and then some new double paddle prototypes in about a month. All right, take care. I'll see you next time.